<clears throat> Reading from James Hillman's Animal Presences. And this is a section on the animal kingdom uh, called Body. <clears throat> I want to carry my critique of depth psychology's view of animal images further than its assumptions about instinct versus culture and further than its use of each animal as an allegorical disguise for these so-called human instincts. We also need to question the identification of animal with body. Body is a curious word in English, tending to mean a limbless, headless central mass, a torso or trunk, unarticulated and coagulated, clumped and even inert. Often it is a collective noun, a body of water, a body of soldiers, a body of writings. Its derivation is obscure. The Anglo-Saxon bodhi, going back to the old high German bota, pota, is probably related with the German botique, brewing tub, cask or vat. This relation is doubtful and there are no others. The word is an orphan without cousins. Pokorny's giant etymological encyclopedia does not elaborate it. Onion's masterwork on the ideas of body organs and functions does not discuss the very word in the book's title. Fast Thieneman's two-volume Freudian study of language claims that in language, the human body is the primary reality and the references to the body and the body processes are prior to any object reference. Yet Thastheneman foregoes examination of the prime word, body, to which he claims all others refer. Body, the primary referent of phenomenology and the transcendent metaphor of school after school of therapy, remains a curiously unreflected word in the English language. Perhaps this unreflectedness is precisely what body signifies, a kind of dumb, brute event, direct, naive, and unarticulated. It seems to be the root metaphor of the naturalistic fallacy in psychology. Therapeutic attempts to differentiate body, awakening it and reaching psyche through it, e.g. the body therapies, must thus be attempts to work through not body as such, but consciousness trapped in the naturalistic perspective. Animal images can, be different, can differentiate this naturalism. Instead of locating the animals in the body, we can break up body into animals and mat imagery. A variety of animal pairs pull the many chariots of sexual love, as depicted in murals in Ferrara, thereby differentiating the sexual body into a swan-like style, a pig-like style, or a manner of mating like two turtle doves. Physical life, instinct, is always imaged. Body is always carried by the soul in a specific fashion, and this carriage derives from the soul's images. The animal images are thus carriers or vehicles of bodily existence. Or better said, there is no such thing as body as such, as there was no word for it in biblical Hebrew, but there are many varieties of animal images more relevant to actual behavior and more precisely efficient for capturing its patterns than the general concept body. When animals are equated with body, one of two things tends to happen. Either the animals must represent the stupidity of the body, that is low, driven, and desirous, a headless and burdensome beast, as W.B. Yeats says in his last poems, The Man and the Echo. Waking, he thanks the Lord that he has body and its stupidity. Or the animals are praised for their marvelous instinctual sureness. The wisdom of the body is the natural superiority of the million-year-old inner animal. To become healthy and normal, one must only let the animal lead by following the body. Another poet, Gerald Burns, questions psychology's idealization of the body. Analysis of mind is incomplete when body means something normal and how one twists in vain or rage escapes the attention. By assigning animals to the body, we normalize their specific peculiarities. They disappear in a collective noun, that tub as melting pot. They lose their names. We neglect that an ape body differs from a horse body and that again differs again to the horse in the image. Does it kick at the stall slats, pull a beer wagon, take sugar with its lips? What color is it and where is it and whom is it with? A dream animal is in the image and not in the body. Besides, the animal in a dream presents not my body, whatever the word connotes, but it but its body, the, the essential otherness of its shape and motion, the self-display of its physical presence. Body beyond interiorization. There was a time when psychoanalysis had to interiorize the animals, degrade them into an inner psychic menagerie, that microcosm of origin, the standard Latin topos of the animal soul as jungle or zoo within the human being. 
Interiorization into instinct, into body, were ways to reclaim what had been thrown out and away and to bring the animals into an inner feeling of kinship. After the extreme ontic otherness of the Stoics, Romans, Christians, and Cartesians, where the animal was merely amusement, property, meat, and machine, interiorization at least gave the animal kingdom a habitation in the soul. The soul, however, has undergone a long process of subjectivism. It is no longer the psyche in the platonic sense, I inside it. Soul has taken on the interior personalism of Augustine, it inside me culminating in the introspective identification of all soul events as mine, my emotions, my body, and its needs. Thus, the mouse in the dream is my trepidation, and the pig, my greed. Eminence has lost its otherness, which Jung tried to restore with his notion of the objective psyche, where images exist in their own right, like the fox in the forest, which is not mine just because I see it. So the fox in the dream is not mine just because I dream it. For the animals to exist in their own otherness, they have to be kept safe from the law of compensation that declares the dream is strictly causal, always in compensatory relation with the conscious mind. So long as I can affect the animals in my dreams by the stance I take in the day world consciousness, the transcendent otherness of the kingdom within cannot be distinguished from my unconscious psychological life, the sins and wishes of emotions that the animals have been forced to represent." They reside not inside human nature, but inside our view of human nature. Our subjectivist personality theory constructs the cages of the inner zoo. The law of compensation has delivered dream animals wholly into human hands, the hands of our humanistic interpretations. What I have been criticizing is functionalism, symbolism, or subjectivism can be subsumed under interiorization. Animal images as representation of organ, drive, or Dyson Weiss is a still a degradation, even if this mode is the most subtle and psychological. Lost is the animal as other, its ownership of itself as a self-possessed creature with its own nature not assimilable to mine. Can we leave the animal out there in its otherness and yet retain its psychological import and our kinship with it? Can we remain psychological without interiorizing? Henry Frankfurt wrestles with a similar question regarding the animal god relation in Egyptian religion. First of all, Frankfurt says the term animal gods is wrong. They were not totemic figures. There was no sacred bonding with the animal, and the animal did not function as a symbolic representation of a god in the way that an eagle elucidates the character of Zeus. There was nothing metaphorical in the connection between god and animal in Egypt. No functionalism. No interiorization. Rather... Animals as such possessed religious significance for the Egyptians. Their attitude might well have arisen from a religious interpretation of the animal's otherness. A recognition of otherness is implied in all specifically religious feeling. Here Frankfurt refers to Rudolf Otto. We assume then, says Frankfurt, that the Egyptian interpreted the non-human as superhuman, in particular when he saw it in animals, in their inarticulate wisdom, their certainty, their he unhesitating achievement, and above all, in their static reality. With animals, the continual succession of generations brought no change. They would appear to share the fundamental nature of creation, its repetitious rhythmic stability. Each animal confirms that living forms continue. They are eternal forms walking around. An animal is eternity alive and displayed. Each giraffe and polar bear is both an individual here and now and the species itself, unchanging, always self-creating according to kind. Each polar bear represents the eternal return of the polar bear spirit as a guardian, a spiritus rector, from which, according to Ivor Paulson, speaking of the circumpolar Arctic peoples, the very idea of a god arises. Gods originated within the animal world itself, that is, with the actual animal. This offers an answer to the question about the nature of the animal rubrics, the general bestiary names, i.e., e.g., pig, eagle, crab. Species names go back to Adam in the Garden of Myth. Each species is a primordial substance or living archetype as visible image to which the question of origin, being temporal, cannot apply. The origin of the species is outside historical empirical knowledge. The species can be apprehended themselves as origins, as revelations of eternal forms, and so theories repeatedly turn to them for the secret of origins. 
And the animal image is the etern, return, eternal return in Iliad's sense, the recorso, not as a death instinct, repetitious into entropy, but issuing forth ever the same from creation, as the thundering herds of buffalo to the plains Indians were always the same buffalo charging up from the earth each spring, not subject to history, each species breaking through history. Repetition as renewal, a blessing, a witness to continuing creation. So when the last giraffe, the last white bear falls dead, it is also the first giraffe whom Adam named and who was on the ark. Its fall is the extinction of an eternal seed, a divini divinity killed, deicide. Their certainty, their unhesitating achievement, their static reality, Frankfurt says, confirms in humans an animal faith. We rely on the term animal to express our unquestioning confidence in the reality of being. What we abstractly call instinct is a behavior of certainty, exhibiting faith in repetitious static realities, following the path, as Jung said, with great regularity. The Western cult of change through human will, its belief in historical progress, of course, declares these witnesses of primordial faith in the reality of continuity to belong to a lesser kingdom or declares them already by definition extinct, that is, soulless, irrational, or mechanical. But the recovery of these forms in our dreams can restore that animal faith in the repetition of continuing realities, that animal certainty, as Frankfurt calls it, or preservation of the species, as biology calls it. The animal is the unhesitating answer to nihilism. It must go on, each according to its own kind. In each animal, the ark is recapitulated in the garden. In illo tempore, this morning in your dream. The otherness of each animal form is what I believe Adolf, Adolf Portman's scrutiny of concrete nature brought us to see and feel for 30 years at Aranos. Curiously, his lectures were for many years the last ones, each year closing with his disguised tribute to the animal kingdom as more recently has been closing with the theme of Egypt, whereto the animal could not be more honored. Closing lectures that by ritually invoking the animals bespeak our faith in the continuity of Aranos. Portman insisted that appearance, like experience, is a basic characteristic of being alive. All living things are urged to present themselves, display themselves, to show ostentatio, which was a common Latin translation of the Greek fantasia, fantasy. Each animal's ostentation is its fantasy of itself, its self-image as an aesthetic event without ulterior function. Portman brought many kinds of evidence for these unaddressed appearances, for example, the small transparent oceanic creatures that live in the interiors of the other larger creatures or below the depths where light cannot reach have no visual organs themselves and whose brilliantly vivid and symmetrically patterned forms serve no functions, neither as messages to their own species as attractions or warnings, nor as disguises. Sheer appearance for its own sake, unaddressed. Here, self-display is realized in its purest form. Appearance is the result of a very specific structure of the plasma. It is its own purpose. <clears throat> Appearance is its own purpose. Does this not say that the animal is an aesthetic creation, that the animal eye is an aesthetic eye, and that the animal is compelled by an aesthetic necessity to present itself as image? Portman's radical insight into the biological necessity of the aesthetic explodes the sheerly functional notion of animals, struggling to feed and breed, ever in fear and trembling, their demiur as mere territory or possessive property, and whose reason for being on earth is sheer preservation without spirit, without sport, without play. And we see, too, how human psychology, by using this narrow view of animal life, cannot take their images and dreams otherwise, implying that the way back to the animal kingdom for humans must be only through brutalism and bestiality, sex, body, territory, fight, flight, release mechanisms, imprinting nature still in red and fang and claw. Then a behavioral biology-based psychology must view the aesthetic as a secondary accompaniment of more species-preserving functions or as incidental decoration. Psychology has refused to see that the animal kingdom is first of all an aesthetic ostentation, a fantasy on show of colors and songs, of gates and flights, and that this aesthetic display is a primordial instinctual force laid down in the organic structure. Our attempt to deliteralize interiorization has taken a second step. 
First, we had to see that the interiority of animal images is not inside us. Now we are led to see that this interiority is also not inside them. Their inner leak shape is in their appearance. The interior selfness of the animal appears in its displayed image. The interiority need not follow anthropomorphic and subjective notions of memory, experience, and intentionality. Not self-consciousness, but self-presentation. I am continuing here with a theme I began to formulate last year as a depth psychology of extroversion. The turn to the world as a psychological arena where any event displayed to the senses is also in imaginative form. From this depth perspective of the world, all things are displays and imagination and perception, invisible and visible, intuition and sensation do not fall apart when discerned with an animal eye. How to gain this animal eye? How to put yourself inside the pig? We have touched upon several ways making phylogenetic correspondences with human embryology, interiorizing the animals as human physiology, seeing stereotypical behaviors as allegories, the greedy pig, discovering the symbolic essence by means of amplification, the devouring earth mother pig. Now let us move beyond correspondences, symbolization, interiorizing in living forms as metaphors. Let us attempt another entry into the animal kingdom. Can we climb aboard the ark? A man dreams. I am walking with my wife outdoors somewhere. We notice a lot of ants. We get interested in them, even getting down and looking at them from eye level, maybe even picking them up like being one of them, seeing things as they do. In the next dream, the wife kneels down to a dog in order to show some children who cannot learn the dog's tricks how to do it, and the dog then easily performs his trick. By bringing our superior postures to the level of the creature, kneeling to it, condescension, we begin to see as they do, a transposed eye. Gods retain this animal eye. Their animal heads and animal masks display their animal consciousness. The head of the animal on the human torso maintains that lower eminent vision of creatureliness, creator and creature, God and animal in the same figure. To see with the creaturely eye is an act of imagining the world so that it appears in continuing animation, in a continuing play of creation with which human consciousness participates by means of imagining acts. Not the creative imagination as some wondrous gift that creates images, art, and ideas. Rather, the transposed eye itself releases what is into its own createdness, each event as a presentation of creativity. The human imagination is not the creator, does not create. It sees the creative, creatively in the world's ongoing show. It's spiel. Spiel, play in English, is rooted in the meanings to dance for joy, to rejoice, be glad, as the Hebrew legends of the animals who chant and sing praise. The word play is packed with animal motions. It means to strut, dance, or otherwise display oneself as a cock bird before hens, to move about swiftly with a lively, capricious, goat-like motion, to fly, to dart to and fro, to frisk, flit, flutter, oscillate freely, the play of light on shining, glinting, bright surfaces like feathers, shells, scales. With animals in mind, an idea of play stands forth as the revelation of fantasy in action, its free motion, its animated joy in the presentation of an image. With animals in mind, play is the visible display of the invisible, free of purpose, of function, other than its own display. The phonetic link between play and display. And I have learned from Paul Kugler that such links may indicate profound connections, suggests that the animal's urge to self-revelation is reason enough for its creation. That is precisely the help it offers Adam. The animal continually reminds that the play of creation is revelation. To be is to be seen. Beauty is given with existence. As Portman shows, to be seen is as genetic as to see. The organic structures of patterning, coloring, and symmetrical display are as genetic as the ocular organs that allow seeing the display. In fact, the coat is genetically prior to the eye that sees the coat. 
It is this beauty of the phenomenal and its everlasting return of the same that the animals reveal as if they revel in their own fantasy, not information, not communication, not metaphor, beyond understanding and meaning, the beauty of these amazingly complicated and other living beings. It is as if they say, look at us with respect, respect, which means look again, as if Adam's eyes were made to see their images or to see them as archetypal images. Inside the ark, it was dark, of course, for the ark was covered with pitch inside and out, Genesis 6.14. By what light then did the creatures see? What is the vision of these seeds in the ark, the essential vision? Jewish legend says that God sent the archangel Raphael to Noah with a book of wisdom in which were written all the secrets and mysteries. By means of this book, Noah knew how to fulfill his task and gather the animals. With him into the ark, he took his book and it was made of sapphires and by means of its light, all the creatures creatures in the ark could see. The incorruptible substance of the calum is the light by which the corruptible animals see. The natural animals have an imaginal vision. The physical world perceives by a metaphysical light. To restore to our human eye that sapphire light, we must be pressed in among the animals against the pitch wall. The way to the imaginal lies in the animal. Implications of this blue sophic light are to be sought in the writings of Gershom Sholem, Henry Corbin, C.G. Young, and in the 50-year books of Aranos. We come to these conferences for the sake of that light. For my part, let me suggest only that the eye that sees by a sapphire vision is brought by the animal in the dream. The blue vision is inside the pig, and we get inside the pig for the sake of its sapphire light. Interiorization is not them in us but we with them inside the ark. Why do they come to us, the animals, if not a part of us, if not subjective, partial drives, symbolic representations of stereotypical styles, but presences, diamonds? What do they want inhabiting our dreams? Why does the polar bear come through the door, the eagle descend to sit among men? A woman dreams. There are a lot of tiny animal creatures who have fragments of an original knowledge, guidance, which they preserve jealously with great tenacity to keep it and them alive. I watch them guarding these fragments and scurrying around, building or rebuilding their living place, and I feel reassured and hopeful. I know without being able to say why it is so that these holy fragments will last forever, go on forever, yet will help only if these creatures give them their utmost care and attention." Are these creatures the animal guardians that the creation may perpetuate, and do they claim a similar careful attention from us? Can we know the answer without attending to them, speaking with them? We may guess what they, why they come, but let us yield the degrading beliefs that they come for our subjective purposes to compensate our omissions. Perhaps they fear the loss of human kinship, that they have already been excluded from the next ark, or that the gods have deserted them so that they are like a displaced people, merely an ec ecological problem for administrative solutions and charitable pity. Imagine pity for an eagle. We cannot know what they come for until we first start to wonder, until we turn the plane around and look into the water where the bear waits, until we feed deep, deep upon that pig's black and peerless eye until we condescend to the ant. These theophanies, are they calling the dream soul into their kingdom? We know the record of extermination. The animal kingdom from the cavemen through Darwin on the Galapagos and Melville on the whaler is no more. Insecticides lie on the leaves. In the green hills of Africa, the bull elephants are brought to their knees for their tusks. We long for an ecological restoration of the kingdom that is impossible. Yet it is a noble longing, for it houses a utopian impulse, an impulse that can be satisfied in the no world, nowhere world of the dream. There their souls and ours meet as images. The dream is an ark in which all living forms, according to their kinds, can abide during the eternal cataclysm that is coterminous with the ark. Do they come to remind of the cataclysm that occurs wherever humans fail to see by a blue light? Fail to see that the invisibles is in the perceptible, that the invisible that shadows appearances with their otherness unaddressed to our needs and meanings, do they come so that we may still see beauty, even to save beauty? 
The restoration of the animal kingdom is thus a restoration of ourselves to that kingdom via the dream where motifs that we encountered in dream after dream of the research extend beyond the heroic stereotypes of mythic amplification. The animal as fearful and dangerous, its conquest and our superiority to motifs of learning from the animal, amazed by its beauty, touched by its pain, reconciliation with it, being born, helped, saved by the animal. These dream motifs restore the reason given in Genesis 2 for the creation of the animals as sucker, easier. The terrible wildness of animals disappears in messianic times, say both Jewish legend and the Sibylline oracles. These moments of restoration appear in dreams, saved by the swimming bear. Piglets are risen and delighting the animals, restored to life in the glass case. It has been said many times at Eranos that the soul is in exile from its platonic possibility, the terra pure, the temple, but the restoration may require another more prayer. Recovery of the Ark and Eden, a recovery expressed today as an ecological nostalgia for a topos, a perimeter where human and animal share the same kingdom. But the dream itself encloses us protectively in the saving ark, in the originating garden. And here, there in the dream, we may recover the habits of the crab and the mouse, the knowledge of the pig, the animal coat, the animal tail, the animal eye. Is it possible that it is we who are delivered into their hands to guard us from our own extinction? Yet we cannot summon them. They are other. It is for them to come to us. Will an eagle dive? Will a crab take hold tonight? Sleep and hope for a pig.